Today we have another great economist with us uh, to talk about a new curriculum that he is putting into play, and uh, that is Dr. Peter, Pr Peter Frank. Uh, Peter is the Interim Dean and Associate Professor of Economics and the Porter B. at the Porter B. Bryan School of Business at Wingate University and a Free Enterprise Fellow at the Jesse Helms uh, Center. Our good friends at the Jesse Helms Center, as you know, John Dodd leads that and he helps uh, spread the free market word across the state. So, um, uh, Peter is with us today and in this presentation he will introduce the new curriculum Free Enterprise Now and discuss the importance of teaching the principles of free enterprise to students beginning in middle school and he will discuss the value of the free enterprise system for young people and why this curriculum is essential for the next generation. So without further ado, Peter Frank. Thank you very much and uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again at the Shaftesbury Society. I spoke to this luncheon about, I think it's been about four years ago and uh, at that time I spoke about the free market and government at a crossroads and I made the claim that I felt and I believe we're at a crossroads for, for two reasons. Um, the first I said at, at that lecture was there's a broad misunderstanding of the fundamentals of the market process which is more prevalent than ever. And I also uh, argued that a political process that leads to huge overspending and, and ballooning deficits per, particularly through the regulatory process is something that is profoundly uh, um, detrimental. And the first reason that, that I just mentioned is what I've tried to address directly through my um, you know, job as a professor teaching young students at the college level, but then also in this partnership with the Jesse Helm Center, this curriculum that I'll mention uh, a little bit today. But I believe that the fundamental idea of the free market, what it means, how it works, why an economy should be organized this way is misunderstood today more than ever. Um, an economic system labeled a free market or free enterprise has become meaningless in terms of terminology in some respect. Many believe today that the free market is an economy that has some principles of markets, for example, free prices or, or generally free prices, but one that is managed by the state. Again, this increasing belief in the use of the term free market for the U.S. economy is having a profound effect on how people view the role of government and the role of government management of the economy. So, so the, you know, the question obviously that I ask um, regularly is what makes an economy free? And one way to measure this is probably uh, familiar to many of you, but we live in a free market system that um, has become synonymous with some general primary measures of what it means to have economic freedom, specifically looking at the overall size of government, the regulatory burden, the level of free trade, the protection of property rights, and the role of monetary policy. But depending on how you measure those three variables, or excuse me, those five variables, the U.S. scored in the top three countries globally in the year 2000 based on Heritage and Cato are the large groups that do uh, a freedom index and today it ranks 13th or 14th. And so one question is why the decline? Well this change over the past decade can be traced back I believe to the huge change in the regulatory burden on the economy. Changes made under the guise of what is necessary to get the economy back on track based on the most recent financial crisis quoted or uh, argued to begin around December 2007. But I believe these changes are the result of a broad support for a managed market economy. Or worse, due to the belief that the free market economy is really one that must involve extensive government oversight. And so a few, a few points of data to show the increasing management of the economy by the state. Um, number one, the startup rate of new businesses is down about 20% since 2009, and in part, the regulatory burden to startup is, plays a role. The second is the huge subsidies to large corporations that have only grown annually, especially in the agricultural and energy sectors. Uh, the idea of too big to fail bailouts, 
uh, fourth, the role of lobbying and its contributions to the regulatory burden. And then also, I think, uh, which leads me into what I want to talk about more today, a general mis misunderstanding of the important role entrepreneurs play in the economy. And I believe this is most critical because how the rules of the economy exist determine, in large measure, whether entrepreneurs are going to be productive or not. So let me, let me give you a couple uh, brief examples here. In terms of the fourth point I made, the role of lobbying, um, an interesting uh, kind of method I used in my class is I taught a class throughout the semester on, you know, a pretty straightforward economics course where we talked about regulation and many other components of the macroeconomy. And I asked my students on the final exam, say you have two firms that are competing against each other. And these two firms are, of course, trying to gain market share and broaden their market base and become more profitable. I ask the students, based on what they know, what they've learned, and what they feel would be the most efficient and effective way for one firm to compete and take market share from the other firm. And to much horror of mine and probably many in this room, a very large percentage of the course answered that question by saying that one firm should use the political process to gain advantage over the second firm. And unfortunately, that wasn't the answer I was hoping to read but one that they obviously saw amidst their uh, you know, observation of the state, but one they both, one they viewed as a legitimate means of competing against another firm. My last point um, on the general misunderstanding of the important role of entrepreneurship in the economy, this um, became very clear to me about 15 years ago when I read a seminal article by a, a relatively famous economist named William Balmel who wrote an article back 25 years ago called Entrepreneurship, Productive, Unproductive, and Destructive. And in this article, Baumel points out that there will be a certain level of entrepreneurs in any society. So it's not a mystery where entrepreneurs come from or the fact that they exist. But the key is that it's not the shortage or lack thereof of entrepreneurs that exist, but it's the incentives in society that that determine where these entrepreneurs are going to spend their productive time. So will they focus their entrepreneurial creative efforts through market means generating productive, re using resources productively to create value? Or will they use the political process or what, what um, many of us have learned in terms of crony capitalism in the relationship between markets and government to, you, to uh, be quote, creative, to extract resources from others. And so that's the question that I pose to my students today, and one that I'm trying to use this curriculum to educate others about, is how can we, can we understand the role of entrepreneurship in the free enterprise context, and why it is so important for our uh, economy to continue to flourish. So my goal as an economist and educator is to help students at the college level, but in this curriculum that I want to talk about briefly today at the middle and high school level, to learn about the importance of free enterprise and the role entrepreneurs play in society. But in addition, my hope is that this program will encourage students to think more critically about the increasing encroachment of government policy into economic activity and on how destructive this can be to creativity and human flourishing. So in conjunction with the Jesse Helm Center, I'm a free enterprise fellow, as, as was mentioned, at the Jesse Helm Center. We've uh, put together this curriculum that can be used in the context of middle and high school students in a, very, in a variety of ways, tailored to many, many different contexts. And uh, as you see on the website here that I have, it's uh, labeled Free Enterprise Now. And I want to play for you this brief introductory video and then um, speak to you a little bit more about the curriculum. Welcome to the course Free Enterprise Now, presented by the Jesse Helm Center. I'm Dr. Peter Frank, Associate Professor of Economics at Wingate University and you're about to embark upon a journey of discovery that will give you a clear picture of the free enterprise system and the role entrepreneurs play in the market economy. In this course, we examine and explore the foundations of the free enterprise system and how it works. 
What makes the free enterprise system the only correct way to organize the economy is that it works in a way that most people don't expect, and it's the only system that considers human nature. Additionally, the average person, when asked about the economy, thinks that it's a big pie, and everyone's fighting to get a piece. If one person's piece gets too big, it must be detracting from everyone else's piece. In other words, the economy is a zero-sum game, and there's a limited amount of pie to go around. Yet this is not the case when the economy operates under a free enterprise system. Instead, freedom to be innovative and creative with fewer regulations leads to specialization and increased trade and has the effect of a dynamic and constantly changing economy, making the pie bigger. Everyone's peace can increase at the same time. This program then teaches the benefits of this system by explaining why and how the pie grows to show how all the elements work together from the standpoint of one small business owner seeking to achieve the American dream, we introduce the character Gustavus Berry, a.k.a. Gus. We'll call him Gus Berry and his business is, you guessed it, making pies. As we go through each lesson, Gus will be used as an example as he navigates the business world, creating his pie company known as Gooseberry Pies you will be able to better understand the free enterprise system as we discuss Gus's pie business. This course will consist of five lessons. Number one, introduction to the foundations of free enterprise. What is the primary basis for a free enterprise system? Number two, the entrepreneurial role. Business planning and development. What does it take to create and start a business? Third, running a business marketing, pricing, and promoting products, managing a successful enterprise. Fourth, leadership and ethical decision-making, running a business with integrity and why ethical leadership is crucial for success. And finally, the intersection of business and government, how to operate a business in an environment with ever-increasing regulation. We look forward to embarking upon this journey together as we examine how and why the free enterprise system is the only way to organize an economy. So, as you see there, that gives you a little bit of an introduction to what we've tried to do with this curriculum. And as I mentioned, this is a unique curriculum where we seek to educate students about the value of the free enterprise system, but also then the role of entrepreneurs play in society and what, how uh, markets lead to ethical and, and constructive business development and the way businesses interact with government. So as I indicated, we're targeting this program to high and middle school students in a, you know, any school context. And I'll speak uh, more about that towards the end. But let me give you just a brief introduction of each part of the program. As I mentioned, the course will consist of five lessons. And the first, possibly the most important lesson, I believe, but it's the beginning of of the program where we discuss the introduction to what is the free enterprise system. And many of you in this room will likely understand the basic economics be behind how markets work and why, as Friedrich Hayek famously wrote, we don't simply have to solve some sort of math or calculation problem to determine what is the most efficient means of resource allocation. In fact, this is not the foundation or the core problem that economics is trying to solve. That is, what is the most efficient means to allocate resources? But we begin this program with a lesson on why freedom and liberty are the foundational components to what it means to be a human being. And that's where I believe students at a young age need to be introduced to and understand why we in this room and organizations like the John Locke Foundation support liberty. This is where the justification to free markets begin and I believe is largely lost on many individuals in our society, both young and old. Economics is a science of choice, and choices are necessary in all areas of life due to limited scarce resources, and choice cannot happen without freedom. And young people don't seem to understand that today. In fact, in Milton and Rose Friedman's famous book, aptly titled Free to Choose, they mention what I believe is the core, albeit subtle, problem that harms many economic systems today. 
And they note, writing shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that despite the drastic change in greater number of free market economies, many governments remain committed to socially engineering all aspects of society. Consequently, we believe that educating younger, the younger generation as to why free enterprise is the only system in which is consistent with human nature or what it means to be a human being is so important because it is absent in most curricula today. The second lesson, as I mentioned in that intro video, focuses on what is the entrepreneur and how individuals are the drivers of innovation and change in the economy. And in this lesson, we focus on how the character introduced before you, Gus, started his pie business and what steps are necessary to operate a business in a free enterprise economy. And so students in that lesson, the second lesson, get an understanding of what is entrepreneurship, an understanding of the stages of business development and in, from the innovation and creative process all the way to marketing and selling a business. And then students also gain an understanding of the nature of risk and how the market process actually works. And uh, we believe it's so important to help students understand that entrepreneurs and the business they create are not the result of random decisions, that people just wake up one day and argue, oh, I think I'll start a business. But it's an important interaction between individuals and markets in the signaling mechanism that determines what resources are desired and needed. And in a free market economy, we know that opportunities are created for entrepreneurs to discover and create new products or services that have a potential profit. And the profit potential that exists is not something that is um, usually twisted in our media and overall societal marketplace as something that's negative, but it's actually a signaling mechanism, just like traffic lights. Green means go, red means stop. And this role of entrepreneur is part of a response to those signaling mechanisms that exist in the marketplace. And so with an unregulated price system, we explain throughout this curriculum that entrepreneurs are poised to take advantage of these opportunities that they might other not otherwise be able to take advantage of. And so the forms of entrepreneurship that we discuss in this video are an essential role to the market process. And without these entrepreneurs bringing opportunities to the market, they're going to respond to the other incentives that exist. And this is where we begin to lead towards the end of the, in the fifth lesson, to the role of government and how the twisting incentives enter in through, in large measure, the regulatory process. And there's a lot of good examples of this. And I know I was speaking um, just here a few minutes ago during lunch that you know, if we imagine a world in which there are no properly established free markets or free prices to communicate the signals, we see all sorts of distortions of what goes on in the market. And in this scenario, you know, the outcomes that are likely to occur are ones that are historically we can point back to, but are so very, pre excuse me, so very uh, prevalent. And free prices are necessary to allow us to demonstrate the proper signals to entrepreneurs. And um, I think engaging students with good examples about that is going to be crucial for communicating the value of the free enterprise system. The third lesson is where we get into a lot of the nuts and bolts of what we're trying to communicate in terms of actually running a business. What does an entrepreneur do? So students will learn how to target a market for a new good or service. And they'll learn various stages that can be, and strategies that can be used to determine prices and targeting um, specific consumers. So this lesson gets into, as I mentioned, a lot of the nuts and bolts of what an entrepreneur does. Target market, business segmentation, and we also speak about the practical aspects of running a business, such as pricing and promoting products, communicating a message and proper uh, messaging is key. Then we get into the, the final two lessons, which depart a little bit from the actual specifics of the entrepreneur, but talk about the characteristics of what it means to be an ethical leader, and then also the relationship between business and government. So the fourth, in the fourth lesson, students learn about 
um, and are able to define the basis of what it means to make ethical decisions in any context. But then we apply these to the business context. And that they see the basis of free enterprise is rooted in an ethical moral framework. So we begin talking about ethics and character development first as an individual, but then as leadership and how we relate to and interact with other people. And in this way, what we need fundamentally is to become more ethical is understanding what it means to think. Think critically and think with some sort of ethical foundation. And so we focus this lesson on the first stages, as I said, the relationship between an individual and individual decision making. And then we, we get into a broader understanding of leadership and how leadership is rooted first in being an ethical leader and it involves how you communicate and interact with other people. And then we get into one of, I think, uh, uh, the problems with understanding the role of entrepreneurship today with many young people and adults, but what is the difference between leadership and management? Establishing a vision for a company is an essential role for an entrepreneur, but may not be the same role as someone who is in management. So leaders make the most of what they have, they inspire people, they create vision, but the traits of leaders and the traits of managers aren't always identical. And so again, this is another key lesson, I believe, targeted towards people in their high school years is so critical in that focusing on the relationship between ethics, leadership, and management is something that I never heard until I was even older than my college years. And so business leaders, um, I think, when we create that framework, should maybe get a, a fundamental shift towards how businesses are viewed in society. I mean, one example that I like to give is that Often people think of Bill Gates as a great entrepreneur who created the vast empire of Microsoft. Society looks at Bill Gates, I ask my students the question, does society look at Bill Gates and what he did for Microsoft as a more successful person today running the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or as starting the corporation Microsoft? And it's often viewed that Bill Gates now is a point in his life where he can finally give back. Well, I think that's the exact wrong message that people need to hear. Because what Bill Gates gave to the world through the value creation of Microsoft is profoundly more than he'll ever give to the world through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so I think young people need to be taught that in business, we don't need to ask the question, well, after I'm finished with my business career, then I can give back. But giving back is by creating a good or service that can increase value in the world and this can be viewed as a high virtue. The final lesson um, that we discussed, as I introduced in the video, is the lesson of uh, the relationship between government and free enterprise, which is where I began my talk a few minutes ago. Is this is, a, is, is shifting, and I believe dramatically, in our world today. And in this lesson, students learn that the origins of business regulation and public policy were really based on the origins of what it meant to govern a free society, is protection of that freedom, not encroachment into that freedom. So we begin this lesson by discussing the founding of America and based on these principles of liberty and freedom, which created the initial basis for government and the role of government in business. And that's the primary role that it should remain, is to protect individual freedom. But over time, the steady growth of American government has led to an increasing role for the laws and regulations to impact businesses and the entrepreneurs that run those businesses. And so we look at some specific examples in this final lesson to show that business regulation has a long and powerful legacy that has only had a steady upward trend over the past 100 years. Today, the US government contains over 70 federal regulatory departments, agencies, commissions. Over 300,000 full-time employees are involved in federal regulatory process. And this, the list of regulations passed by these agencies hovers around 165,000 pages. This is often something young people have never heard. And this data provides the context for understanding the vast role of the regulatory state. 
With some re while, while some regulations may be necessary in some contexts to protect individual freedom, students need to be uh, clear and need to have a clear understanding that the barriers in place that impact entrepreneurial behavior are extensive. And the goal of regulation is to make sure businesses run, quote, fairly. Yet sometimes this regulation attempt is to change the behavior and direction of how resources are allocated entirely. And we can see that in a profound way with the uh, effect on energy industry, for example. Some estimate that the cost of business regulation in American economy today is roughly 10% of GDP or almost $2 trillion annually. And these are, again, messages that young people rarely hear unless they um, have parents like probably many of you in this room. So this curriculum, what we titled Free Enterprise Now, the website I had up there on the screen a minute ago, can be found at freeenterprisenow.com or .org. It's available free online to any educator, whether you're a homeschooled parent, you teach in a private or public school. And it can be used in a variety of ways, and it can be tailored to any length of time, really, that the educator desires. Each of the five lessons that I've outlined here today contain four or five separate videos that are available, again, free on the website. And there are many extra links to articles or other online videos, and we provide discussion questions as well. In addition, we provide a free curriculum guide that we can send to you, which is a multiple page PDF, which gives you opportunity to go through each lesson with additional discussion questions, et cetera. And we hope this program helps middle and high school students gain a deep understanding of the importance of the free enterprise system today and why the system is responsible for the prosperity that exists in our world. And more importantly, we hope that this program educates young people to lead in the business world in a way that continues to create value and to be a voice against the tide of increasing regulatory environment and against the destruction primarily of liberty that defines what it means to be a human being in our world today. So I hope all of you can at least communicate to you know, your family, your friends, and others about the importance of these values and what we're trying to communicate today. And, and please utilize um, the curriculum I've introduced. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. And I'd be happy to take questions or uh, answer anything. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not a, I, I'm, the government forbids me for giving out specific names and grades. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I mean, it was, it was of course, a, a disappointment. You know, I mean, there was a lot of questions that I had back to them in terms of how they came up with their response. Thankfully, no one said they thought it was what I wanted to hear, so I felt good about that. But um, no, I mean, it was, it was kind of the rote response. It, 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 was, it was, you know, I, I challenged them about how, you know, thinking about these ideas a lot more critically than they, they approach them and how, you know, that's really not how we approach the, the whole course. And so it, it created a lot more good feedback and, and dialogue. Yeah. Yes, sir. And then, yeah, please. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the things I'm trying to do in this curriculum that we're trying to do is introduce that idea at a much earlier age. Um, because I think college students, they understand it after they leave my course, and, and many other economists probably um, have the same experience, that when students come in to, to a class, they often view profit as kind of what business owners are trying to extract from individuals to, quote, make money just so that they can get get a, a leg up on on others either their competition or their their consume or the consumers that buy their product and um, I think that that myth is dispelled both in this curriculum and very much so when we try to communicate kind of as I mentioned you know what is necessary to signal economic activity and market price is that opportunity through profit yeah it's good good thought yes sir 
forces stopping. I mean, all of this should have been being taught all the way along. What are the forces stopping? Here? For instance, we have many historical examples. For instance, like the Harding Coolidge administration that cut the government in half. Sure. Brought overseas money back over because they quit taxing it so high and it ushered in the biggest boom time in history at, up to that point. What are the forces stopping this from being taught in our public schools? They should have been taught. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't know if I have the, the answer fully on that. I mean, one, one thing I would argue is that in my profession at the university level, there are a lot of free market oriented economists and individuals. I mean, it's, it's still a small percentage of the total, but there are a lot. But I think one of the big reasons is, is because curriculum at the graduate level is dictated by universities and intellectuals. Curriculum to educate people to teach in public schools and even private schools uh, in, in a large degree is controlled by the state. And so the state determines what social studies education should be or civics education should be. And that's obviously the wrong entity to be driving what is taught and who teaches it. And so I think it requires someone, you know, to, to step outside maybe the norm to educate people in public and private school contexts apart from what curriculum is just said here's what you're supposed to be doing you know and we and, and I, I know the John Locke Foundation and many other organizations in Raleigh continue to try to beat against the state public instruction folks and in, in all the different departments that try to influence public school education but that's sadly where a lot of the instruction begins and it's I, I believe so I believe that the the lock that Department of Public Construction has on telling even what university curriculum should be for public school educators it's a uh, well I mean in some respects but like I said in academia at the college level the state I was just talking before the lecture the state this state and South Carolina and several others have a lot of you know top-notch free market oriented economists that we get together and we talk about these ideas um, and it's there, there's a small group that, that meets we're trying to start to meet annually they're all university professors that espouse you know the ideas of liberty and free enterprise so maybe less so than if I were in a public school I think then I would you know public high school I would probably much more feel like a lone ranger uh, there was a hand over here yes sir sir you were saying that you had learned a lot of these ideas until you were in college exactly yeah so how do we get it down to the high school we just start to talk about it now? yeah yeah I mean I it's that's this is one effort that I'm trying you know out of really my effort my work with the Helm Center and really Jesse Helm's legacy was to try to reach you know he spoke a lot about trying to reach young people before college where your ideas are maybe a little bit less entrenched than they are when you walk into the classroom and you seem to know um, a lot um, and, and, I, and this is one attempt to get there, but I think we need to continue to develop also programs at the university level that are for people who aren't just in college learning like what the Department of Public Instruction says your education should be, but that are like summer institutes and programs that bring in civics teachers and economics teachers at the high school level and teach them how to teach. I'm from I went to high school in Ohio. You may, I don't know if you can tell I'm not from the South originally. But um, there's a university near where I grew up in high school called Ashland University. And they have an organization called the Ashbrook Center. And it's a, it's a free, it's a liberty-minded organization. And they run summer institutes on teaching high school teachers how to teach. Now their focus is much more in government education, less in terms of less in the economics. But they're doing a great a great uh, program there where they bring in high school teachers and they read John Locke. You know, they read um, all the kind of classic uh, liberty-minded philosophers and thinkers. I even think they read some Adam Smith, and um, it helps them. You know, try to train people how to teach high school students. Yeah. 
Oh, I agree. Yeah, 100%. I think here, here, and then there. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, that, that $2 trillion number I gave you is a much more of a direct cost figure. And so to your point exactly, you know, the response to the regulatory environment. Um, I gave the example of Microsoft, you know, because Bill Gates is famous and everybody's heard of him. But I have a friend who works for Microsoft in Charlotte. And we were just talking the other day about the legal costs uh, to Microsoft of their in-house lawyers. And it's, I mean, the percentage of that company's um, annual re uh, expenditures that go to a legal group that is just responding to government is, you know, I mean, it's, it's probably more than the output of some small states in this country. I mean, it might be that high. It's um, unbelievable. Sure. They, they believe they got to keep their job, and the way to keep their job is to do something. Right. And I don't know how you ever change yeah. that because it's like a job protection. Right. Thing. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, people ask me all the time, how would you change the system? And as I mentioned, uh, I alluded to at the beginning, the incentives are all wrong, right? Um, the rules have to be rewritten or maybe followed the way they were originally written for us to see any marked change. So there's some very practical examples that are very hard to get off, get past politically. But one is, of course, it's an age old, it's an age -old policy recommendation, but term limits. Because then you're not, you're not constantly in the cycle of appealing to special interests so that you can pass policy that, that um, engender their votes for you, right? And so we need to change the rules, right? We need to influence politicians to change the rules that limit their power. Now that's, you know, talk about a mountain to climb. I mean, human nature is when am I going to pass a policy that's going to make me less powerful? Well, nobody wants to do that, right? And as much as, you know, I, you know that's why I think looking at lessons of, say, the 80s is great for students today. I mean, as much as Mikhail Gorbachev was not, you know, a, a liberty-minded pro-market freedom guy, he had to make a decision um, to the West to say, I'm going to make a decision that takes away my power. And I give him a lot of credit for that, because he's one really global politician that has done that, and the number is pretty small who've made those decisions. But that's what we have to do. We have to get politicians that are going to say, I'm going to make decisions that are going to, you know, at the end, they're going to cause me to lose. And that's hard. That's a big road. But I don't think we should stop fighting that battle. Yes, sir? Um, I'd like to suggest that we, we, uh, we talk about a high, changing, getting what kids think and so on at the high school level. But I think there needs to be major change in the economics profession at the and teaching at the college level and understanding. I'm, you had sort of a, uh, a special, you, you went Grove City to George Mason. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. going to get a whole different message I know, I know. than someone who goes um, NC State to UNC. Sure, okay? sure. And um, uh, you, 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 profit was brought up, how you teach profit. Well, the way the economics profession looks at profit is horrible, right? They're not being taught what profits really are. You're, you're taught the perfect competition model where the ideal profit is zero. Sure. Right? Sure. And any above normal profit, I mean, any above zero profit is, uh, you know, either rent seeking or monopoly or something sure. like that. So uh, it seems to me that it, the, the, the economics profession has to uh, change its thinking about these things. Yeah. Before, uh, even before it, 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 it's ultimately going to get filtered uh, down into the high school and, uh, and junior high level. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I mean, you're, you're right. Um, and, and you've been at this, I know, a lot of years trying to make this change happen. Um, 
and I, I did have a maybe a storied uh, educational path. I mean, my first teacher in economics was an Austrian man named Hans Senholz, who was an Austrian economist. Who um, I my first ever class in economics was Principles of Macroeconomics, and I was an 18-year-old freshman, and the textbook was Socialism by Mises. That's what it's it's about a you know 800-page book that you know would would never find its way into a principles level classroom probably in any university today. So it, I, yeah, right, right. So I had a different path, but no, I think you're right. I mean, I guess my, my thought is I think we need to work both ends. We need to get students that come into the classrooms at NC State that challenge the professors. And that's hard to do. I mean, you know, I, I probably wouldn't have as an 18 or 19 year old entering challenging a professor. But I think we need that. We need to work that end of trying to teach students these ideals and these principles so that they challenge the university. But we also need to continue to make efforts to bringing in more economists at the university level into uh, a better understanding of just kind of this rote neoclassical, you know, toe the line framework that turns into just a lot of equations and not a lot of, uh, of deep thinking critically about human behavior and incentives and all those important variables. So, I mean, I, I think that's a, a mission we should continue to work on. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. There are so few of them. I don't get it. Yeah. Wow, that's a good it's question. It's a demand thing, and it's not. Yeah, How yeah. It's not um, it could be that the, um, the free market tor type liberty folks that are in the general population see that there's not a whole lot of strong incentives to go into academia, and so they choose not to. Um, I don't want to be that quite that cynical, but. Um, I think it's it's fair. I think we're there are um, efforts being made to change that. I mean, there is a lot of. I mean, it, the South is probably a unique place, but there are a lot of people and programs like uh, Roy mentioned George Mason. But George Mason has helped, you know, spread to many other universities the ideals of free market. Um, both economics and liberty so that new students are coming in that are getting excited about those ideas that are moving on to graduate school that are starting to populate other schools. I mean, I think it's a lot more today than it was even 10, 20 years ago. Um, so I think efforts are being made. You know, like, like, uh, like he mentioned, I went to Grove City College as an undergrad. And if you wanted to go to a school that taught kind of free market e economics um, even 20 years ago, there was a, it was almost on one hand, you could count it up. Um, and I think today there are a lot more. So I'm not, I haven't lost hope, but I don't know, you know, if, if I can answer easily why so few universities mirror the general population, apart from there's not a lot of incentive. You know, I mean, people can care about ideas and want to espouse those ideas and educate those ideas, but there's not a lot of incentive to do that at the university level because it's, you know, it's a tough road to, to hoe. I mean, I'm not giving myself credit because I've had a relatively easy path in the sense that I've been around like-minded people a lot. It seems like there's a pent-up desire by people to be a huge financial yeah. community. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, the, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. I think, though, getting into the university model, it's the, the, meth the, the, the way in which you move through that system. You get promoted. You get job security. You get all those things. It's, it's twisted. I mean, starting a new university. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, I think people are doing that more and more, though, digitally, and, you know, like this example. But there's a lot more opportunities online for people that may, the quality probably still has a r ways to go, but that can find that, those, you know, courses, et cetera. That's, that's a good question. Yes, sir. Um, first comment and then a question. Sure. So, uh, I have a 20-year partnership with Microsoft, now serves as a policy advisor in the General Assembly, so um, I understand the need for trying to create entrepreneurs, but trying, trying to be a, an entrepreneur in government 
Sure, uh, sure. You, know, you continually find yourself ag advocating for free enterprise ideas. Um, but I think this, what work you're doing is important because small business and entrepreneurs will create as many jobs as we're trying to attract via government incentive trying to land the big fish. And so uh, we've got to teach our young people, you know, how that they can achieve the American dream, that they, they can accomplish whatever they want to accomplish, um, you know, using free enterprise ideas. Uh, but I'd be interested in what discussions you've had with the Department of Public Instruction or charters or privates that are using your curriculum. Not a lot yet, just starting to try to, to get, have those conversations, honestly. Um, my, my conversations in the charter school area is very narrow to just around me in the Charlotte region. But I'm, I'm trying through you know, the efforts of, of the folks at the Helm Center that are really the marketing arm to try to have those conversations. So the short answer is not a lot yet. Um, I have had conversations with just individual educators that seem to have interest, but um, l m many more private and homeschool folks than in public schools. But I, I think that, you know, there's, there's work to be done there to have those conversations and to hopefully move this curriculum into other areas. Peter, thank you so much. Oh, thanks.